I uh, can still remember the summer of 1980. Uh, it was uh, July, and I was super excited, as my friends were, and London, Ontario, where I'm from, was equally as excited because Terry Fox was coming through town. And as a 10-year-old, it was the first time I'd ever heard of a hero. Um, I had a chance maybe to meet a hero. So we made our way downtown to hopefully meet this hero, Terry Fox. And we didn't have a chance to meet him, actually, because, to be honest, the crowds were too large and we were too short. <laughs> and I remember going back to school that fall and our teacher talking about Terry Fox and explaining that he was actually a real Canadian hero. And I remember learning and listening to why he was considered a hero, what he had done, his accomplishments, and the risks he took to try and run across the country. And I'm confident as a 10-year-old, I looked at Terry Fox and said, there's absolutely no way I could ever be Terry Fox. I, my friends, like, we could not be a hero. This was something that seemed so foreign to us. And that's the problem with what we do with leaders and with people who do large macro impacts on society. We often hold them up to such a high level that no one ever thinks they can do that or be that, so therefore they don't do it. And the reason why I couldn't be Terry Fox, nor could you or anybody else I knew at that time, is because I, to be honest, it sounds simple and it's almost hard to say, but I didn't have cancer. And I didn't lose a leg to cancer. And I wasn't and still am not a marathoner. And to be honest, two of those three things I never want to experience. I couldn't be Terry Fox. I uh, couldn't be Martin Luther King. You see, he's an incredible individual, but I couldn't be Martin Luther King, nor could anybody I, I, I knew, because I wasn't an African American. I wasn't living during the 1960s civil rights movement. I was a Canadian. I didn't have to experience what he experienced. I couldn't be Martin Luther King, no matter how much I respected and admired what he did. I could not be Malala for many reasons. I'm not a woman. I didn't go to school in Afghanistan. I wasn't threatened with my life. I wasn't shot and survived an attempted murder. I live in Canada. I live in a country that values women's educational rights equally. I could not be Malala. And that's the thing with these leadership people, these, these people of macro impact that we put on these pedestals. And it's a disservice that we do to young people. We tell people they can be these incredible things, but living wherever they live, they don't think they truly can. And so I thought today as... I was to share these stories with you, I would share with you something more important, I think, than the macro impact, and that's the micro impact. I think it's important, almost more important. I think back to the winter of 2005, and I was uh, in Chicago. I had been there for a week speaking, and I was flying home to Detroit. I was running late, so I was rushing to the O'Hare Airport. If you've ever been there, you know how busy it is. It's the fourth busiest airport in the world. And I rushed into the, into the terminal, and, I, I, and I, was, I was shocked because it was virtually empty. So I ran to the counter. I threw down the passport, and I said, Hi, I'm, uh, I'm heading to Detroit. And she smiled and kind of shook her head and said, Probably not today, sir. And I said, Why not? To which she pointed behind her to the big sign, and it had all the flights. He said, cancel, cancel, delay, delayed, cancel, cancel, cancel. What's going on? Well, there's a huge storm east coast, Mr. Saunders, and I don't think anybody's getting out today. And I must have looked super dejected, sad, kind of like a lonely Canadian. <laughs> and she started typing on her computer, and kind of a small smile came to her face. She said, actually, sir, hold on, um... We're going to actually try and get a flight out, looks like, here in a few hours. I could put you on the standby list if you'd like. Now, for those who don't travel a lot or don't know how the standby list works, don't worry, you're not alone. Actually, no one knows how the standby list works. <laughs> if you know somebody who knows somebody, the plans align in a certain way, there's a chance you might get on that plane. Well, I had nowhere to go and I had nowhere to be, so I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. So I went through security and I got to the gate and the gate area was packed with angry, angry Americans. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is overwhelming. And I had to get in line because back then you actually took your paper ticket with you and got in line and you gave it to the gate agent and they put it in their random kind of order and that's how you were chosen, if you were the chosen one. And so I sat there quietly and I listened. And as I listened, I could hear the anger in people's voices as they yelled at the gate agents. The first guy I could hear, about five or six in front of me, he yelled at her and he said, and I'm not kidding, he said, do you know who I am? <laughs> to which she looked down at the ticket and said, yes, you're Mr. Anderson. I'll put you on the list. And the next guy, he was even angrier. He got right up in her face. And he said, if I don't make it back to Detroit tonight, I could miss a meeting tomorrow that would cost my company millions. She says, wow, that's serious. Well, unless you have your own plane, I'll put you on the list. The next guy was my favorite. He was a big guy, beautiful suit, giant watch, strutted up to the counter, and he said, as he reached into his pocket and pulled out a shiny card, he said, I am a five million mile member of the Supreme Galactic Commander, Northwest Airlines, frequent flyer, gold, platinum, diamond <laughs> member. And she looked at him and she said, that is impressive. I'll put you on the list. <laughs> and I look at these two, these two, these two ladies and I, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like they are so wonderful. Look what they are putting up with. And I'm fairly confident it wasn't their plan that day to cancel all the flights from Chicago. <laughs> they weren't hiding behind the counter saying, you know what we should do today? <laughs> Let's cancel some things. When I was a kid, and things weren't going well, I'm talking a young child, my mom could pretty much solve any problem in the world by simply giving me a cold glass of milk and a dad's oatmeal cookie. This was my thing. I, I could break my face outside, run inside, Mom, I broke my face. And she'd say, here's a cookie. And I'd be like, okay. Salty and sweet, mmm. Because the blood and the sugar. Um, <laughs> So I thought, what could I do in this moment to change this moment for these, what micro decision, I didn't think of it then as that, but what could I do to change this moment for these two ladies? So I looked behind me and there was sure enough a store, so I ran into the store and I grabbed two cold milks and a two pack of Mrs. Fields chocolate chip gooey cookies. Oh my gosh, they are good. And when I got to the counter, I threw down the milks and the cookies, I said, these are for you. And they said, whoa. I said, it's okay, I'm Canadian. And they really did relax. <laughs> and I told them the story of the milk and the cookies and why I gave it to them. And I said, listen, I absolutely have nowhere to go tomorrow. I know exactly who I am. <laughs> and I don't think I'm actually a member of the Northwest Airlines Frequent Flyer Program. So I'm sorry that I, I, you're having a bad day. And they smiled and they said, thanks, Mr. Saunders. We'll put you on the list. <laughs> and so I sat down. And about 15 or 20 minutes passed, and the call went in the PA system. Pastor Saunders, please come to the gate. To which I got to the gate, thinking maybe I was getting the flight, and she quickly put that idea out of my head. And she said, Mr. Saunders, I'm fairly confident we cannot get you on this plane, but there's a small chance, but we'll give you a heads up. We're actually going to move from gate 6, where we were, to gate 163. <laughs> it's about two and a quarter miles down the concourse, you might want to get a head start before the herd all moves at once. And we laughed and I got started. As I got down to that gate, sure enough, they called out that flight. Northwest Airlines, flight number 136, en route to Detroit, is moving down to gate 163. And all those people got up and it was like a scene from The Walking Dead. <laughs> You know, the anger and frustration on their face as they pulled the rolly bags. Like, oh my gosh, the humanity. Oh, the horror of this horrible moment. I get it. You have to get home. You're going to be late. I sat down. And they were loading the plane and I wasn't getting on. And I thought, that's okay. That's okay. So I called home. 
And I called and talked to my son, who at the time was about four years old. I said, Matty, uh, Dad's not coming home tonight, but check this out. He's actually going to be sleeping in the airport. To which my son replied, that's so cool. <laughs> and then he said, are you going to build a fort? <laughs> I said, I'm going to build all the forts, Matty. And I, you know, I chuckled and laughed. And the call came in the PA system. Pastor Saunders, please make your way to the gate. So I went up to the gate, phone, my flip phone in my hand. And she said, I'm so sorry. It's all we could do. And she smiled, and I put the ticket in my back pocket, and I sat down, not thinking anything else, because at this point, they were actually taking people and putting them on the next flights for the next day. And I figured that's what was happening, because nobody else was going onto the plane. And I got back on the phone, and she yelled at me across the little waiting room, and she said, Mr. Saunders, please, get your stuff. Let's go. To which I said, why? <laughs> To which she said, because we got you a seat. To which I replied, why? <laughs> so Canadian, right? Like, I'm sorry, you don't have to. I'll be okay. I'm going to build a fort. <laughs> she said, get over here. So I walked over and she said, Mr. Saunders, I got you a seat because you were truly and honestly the only person today that made us feel okay and you made us laugh. You deserve a seat on this plane. And I grabbed my stuff and I ran on the jetway as fast as I could because I was the last person, right, to get on. And I ran, I gave my ticket to the gate agent, uh, to the flight attendant, and he said, Mr. Saunders, welcome on board. I see you're in seat 2A. What? <laughs> Did you say 2A? <laughs> now, for those of you with no reaction in the room right now, <laughs> you may not know that typically rows 1 through row 6 on a flight are first class. <laughs> Bucket list, yes. <laughs> I sat down with my three inches of extra leg room, <laughs> my complimentary orange juice, and my pretzels. It was Northwest Airlines. It wasn't a big deal to be first class. But <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I wanted to make their day with a micro decision for milk and cookies to make them smile, and they gave me a macro moment, a bucket list item checked off. 90 minutes, first class, Chicago to Detroit. <laughs> the small stuff matters. I mean, it really matters. And by the small stuff, I don't mean, I truly don't mean, like this is, this is where we are in 2018 or 2016 when this happened, but that the Instagram logo changed from this to this. Because when it did, when it went from this to this, the world got angry. <laughs> there were thousands of angry tweets at Instagram saying things, and I quote, at Instagram, how could you do this? I've been throwing up all day. <laughs> at Instagram, how could you do this? When I saw it, I dropped my phone. You owe me an iPhone 6. <laughs> it was a couple years ago. At Instagram, my favorite or saddest one was, at Instagram, I hate you all. <laughs> because the logo went from this to this. Having said that, this is my Instagram if you'd like to follow me. <laughs> The small stuff matters. And what I mean is the real, organic, tangible, human, small stuff. Stuff like Officer White, which sounds like a fake name, but it is his name. <laughs> Officer White did something incredible. And rather than me try and tell you, I will share a 53-second video with you. And it will let it, it'll do a much better job. Here we go. See if it works. Let's give it a shot. Thank you. 
her out of trouble. Listen you to your parents, respect your elders, you can be anything you want to be. I'm from the same neighborhood y'all from. I grew up just like this, so only you can change this. And you can change it through basketball and showing respect to your peers like you did. Want a man of my word. But listen, don't ever take money from another stranger, you understand? What an amazing moment. I mean, Officer White made a single micro decision in his day. To summarize, he gets a phone call on a Saturday afternoon to go break up some kids playing basketball because they're disturbing the peace. He could have done what many police officers probably would have done and are probably, you think they might do, is you get out there and get angry, get off the street, you know, stop doing what you're doing. But instead, he decided to play basketball with the kids. His dashboard cam picks it up, it goes back to the police station. They see it, they throw it up on YouTube, great PR piece. It gets seen by millions of people. Shaq, who's a volunteer police officer, volunteers to go out and play basketball, and you see what happened. What a macro experience. Probably life-changing for those kids. And it would be amazing if the story ended there, but it kept on going. They actually got invited to go to the Orlando Magic and sit courtside, meet all the players, get autographed basketballs. Dominic Wilkins and all the coaching staff were there to actually hang out with them. There's Officer White, and there's all the kids. And it'd be great, even, be even better if it ended there, but it kept on going. Officer White created a program, got involved with people like the Harlem Globetrotters, and created a thing called Hashtag Hoops Not Crime so they could raise money to build basketball courts in underprivileged neighborhoods so kids wouldn't have to play on the street. All because Officer White didn't tell them to get off the street. We hear heroes' names like Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi and Terry Fox and Nelson Mandela and Malala, and we think there's no way we could ever be those people, but here's the reality. We have abilities every day. When you leave here today, you have the ability to interact how you choose with every human being. But we often, or more often than we should, we don't even look up from our phones to make eye contact with the human beings that we're talking to, or for that matter, probably not even talking to. I was, um, oh, by the way, this is me and Shaq. Um, <laughs> has nothing to do with the story, but, uh, but it's me and Shaq. Anyway, um, We can, make, we can make impacts every single day. I was at a Starbucks in Victoria, British Columbia, and I want to just summarize with this really organic story for you. I was at a Starbucks in Victoria, and it was packed. It was busy. It was in a lineup. And as you probably know, when you go to a busy Starbucks and you get there, you have to order your high-maintenance drink that we all order from Starbucks. And as I got to my turn, and the barista was there, cup in hand, and she had her marker ready to write down whatever I was going to order... She didn't even make eye contact with me. She looked frazzled and tired, and she said, Hi, welcome to Starbucks. Can I take your order? So I said, Yeah. I'm going to have a grande, no water, soy, chai latte, 168 degrees. <laughs> and she wrote that down without smiling, without making any eye contact. People behind me were trying to get to their order. So she said, Name, please. And I thought, All right. I'm going to try and make her day right here. So I said, Bradley Cooper. <laughs> she didn't even look at me. <laughs> she wrote on the cup, Bradley Cooper, <laughs> and handed down the cup. And I said, okay, we're, we're going to go with this then. All right. <laughs> As I sat down at the other end of the bar where the drinks are being yelled out, Vente, Frappuccino, no fat, extra whip which is an actual drink I heard once at a Starbucks. No fat, extra whip, cross each other out. Um, <laughs> and it got to my drink when she yelled out, grande soy chai, Bradley Cooper? <laughs> to which the Starbucks went quiet, the machine shut down. <laughs> the woman who wrote the name on the cup started looking around. I'm like, you wrote the name on the cup. The girl beside me took her phone out, like, I'm gonna get a selfie with Bradley Cooper. <laughs> Everyone is scanning for Bradley Cooper. I could have said something, but I wanted to marinate in the moment. <laughs> so they yelled out again, Grande Soy Chai, Bradley Cooper. And I said, That's me. <laughs> and the universal disappointment in that Starbucks <laughs> was awesome. The best part was the girl with the phone still got a selfie with me. 
And I said, I'm not Bradley Cooper. She's like, no, but you literally made my day. I have to go back to work and tell this story, and they won't believe me. I'm going to say I met Bradley Cooper. I'm like, my name is Stu. I'm saying I met Bradley Cooper. <laughs> we have the ability every single day to interact with people how we choose. And in 2018, with such a divisive world that we live in, oh my goodness, wouldn't it be great if we had organic conversations with people that made a difference in their day? And the bar is so low. <laughs> it really is. You don't have to do much. You don't. People know who hang out with me. My goal when I walk into a restaurant or a variety store or a Starbucks or wherever I go, I try and walk out with them saying, you made my day. That's all I care about. Stu, are you saying that if we are nice to people that we're going to get uh, upgrades to first class on planes? Yes, I am saying that. <laughs> Sometimes. But I will say this. The leaders and the heroes that we put on these massive, massive pedestals that have done such incredible macro things for the world. Stop and think about it. When Malala stood up in her classroom and said, I want to be educated, and was shot that day, she was not thinking about the Nobel Peace Prize that she would win years later. It was a micro decision. When Martin Luther King did his very first speech in a small church in the South, he wasn't thinking about the Million Man March. He wasn't thinking about doing a speech that would be repeated for decades to come. And when Terry Fox dipped his foot in the Atlantic Ocean, there was himself, his best friend, and his brother. And one CBC reporter, they begged to be there just to document the moment. His goal was $1 million for cancer research in Canada. That was the original goal. Not even $1 for every Canadian, which is often said it was $1 million. He wasn't thinking about that by 2018, Terry Fox runs would have raised close to a billion dollars worldwide. Sometimes, in fact, most times, the people that we put up here started very, very humbly way down here. And so I challenge you today, after this incredible day with incredible people who have taught us incredible things, that you can go out and do something so small and insignificant. It could change someone's life. It could save someone's life. It could make a macro impact on the world. Thank you.